Um, it's great to be here, and especially with the, surrounded by the panel paintings of the late Plantagenets and uh, Tudors, and of course, uh, not forgetting the great panel by the door, which you may have noticed is King Athelstan, the subject of today's talk, Moult Grand Chevalier, as uh, a medieval, later medieval writer called him. As you heard, this has come out of a long project, trying to do a, a big book on Athelstan, and uh, the project has been long delayed, not just by all those film documentaries, but by um, the difficulty of deciding some of the crucial problems of the reign, uh, textual problems, and, of course, among those problems is the location of the great event of the reign, the Battle of Brunanburh, his defeat of a um, North Irish and North British coalition in, in 937 that had invaded England. Um, it's not just of antiquarian interest. Athelstan was an overlord. Um, uh, he uh, kept the, the parts of his empire in... in um, subjugation by the coercive arrangements of an overlord. His uh, subject kings were opposing him in this war, and therefore it would be very interesting to know where it was fought. Was the overlord fighting deep inside his territory? Was he on the fringe of his territory? These are questions. A narrative of those events at the end of his reign, especially in the light of the collapse of his empire at his death, albeit temporary, would be very helpful for us to understand the rain. So um, that's the, the issue, and uh, that's the issue. There he is in a contemporary painting. Um, and uh, we'll come to the general view of these events in a few moments, because there is a, an established view. Um, but bear in mind, I would say, as you follow these arguments, that, that um, great events leave traces. Let's start. People still struggling. How's that, everybody? Can you... Are you getting that? Yeah, great. Um, we're going to start with uh, this text. Um, absolutely fascinating text. We're going to counter the Battle of Brunanburh. Uh, written in about 980 by a member of the royal family, Alderman Athelweird. The original manuscript of his chronicle uh, has, was burned in the cotton fire in 1731, but very luckily Henry Saville did a beautiful edition of it. And there is um, Athelweird's account of these events, uh, written in a chronicle addressed to his kinswoman, Matilda the Abbess of Essen in Germany. He reminds her in the covering letter at the front, which is worth everybody's time to read, uh, that, of course, Athelstan was her great uncle. It was her grandmother who Athelstan had sent to marry Otto of Germany. So there's a family connection here. And here he is in his account of Athelstan, this Rex Robustissimus, very powerful king, in the 12th year of his reign, 13th year of his reign, sorry, uh, there took place a gigantic battle, Pugna Imanis, against the barbarians, uh, in the place called, he doesn't call it Brunanbo, he calls it Brunandun. That hill we'll come back to, the question of the hill. Um, it's so big that from then on, in popular speech, uh, bellum praenominato magnum, the, 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 um, it, it was called the Great Battle in popular parlance, or even, we might say, the Great War. And um, then... The barbarian forces everywhere were, uh, they dominated no longer. Um, afterwards, he himself, it's, it's singular, um, drove them off the shores of the ocean. The Picts and the Scots submitted, and the fields of Britain, Britannides Ava, there was, uh, there was peace everywhere, an abundance of all things, rising the standard of living, archaeologists would say. Um, and, and from that time to this, no fleet of the barbarians has ever come to these shores without a treaty. And a couple of years later, Athelstan died. It's a fabulously elusive passage. Gives you a sense of how the Anglo-Saxon, the old English ruling class in uh, the 980s, the end of the Peace of Edgar, just before Ethelred's reign starts to run into trouble, um, how they viewed these events. And there's other accounts give us the same picture. Alfrich, the great homilist, pupil of St. Athelwold, uh, says that in the last, in the hundred years between 
Alfred and the, the great army of the Vikings and, and the Peace of Edgar. There were two great events, namely Alfred's victory at Eddington and uh, the Battle of Brunanburg, uh, that guaranteed the Pax of Edgar, if you like. Wolfstan Cantor talks about this gigantic battle with horrendous slaughter, he says, against this army of the pagans. So that's, that's how they're seeing it. It's not true, of course, some of it. It's not true that... Um, everything was peaceful after the battle. In fact, there was 15 years of warfare back and forwards between Northumbria and the, and the um, Wessex kingdom. Uh, and and uh, certainly uh, hostile fleets came to Britain. But that's the story they told. I'll leave you with that backstory then before we turn to the events of the battle. I think these, these are the things that are worth remembering. You will recall the desperate battles of Alfred the Great and uh, with his Mercian allies in the 870s, 80s and 90s, of course, against the uh, Danish armies. We know a lot more about them now with remarkable uh, discoveries at Torxey, which are in the Journal of the Society with amazing photographs. Huge winter camp at Torxey of 55 hectares. These are big armies. Um, that's what they're fighting the kingdom of the Anglo-Saxons, which is what they called it, which is the joint Mercian and West Saxon kingdom, uh, with a treaty line down Watling Street and the River Lee. Um, in the 910s, under Alfred's daughter Athelflaed and his son e Edward, uh, they pushed their kingdom, dismantling local Danish forces, some of the big Danish fortresses, the Danish leaders in East Anglia and the East Midlands, they get up to the Mersey, probably not including Lincolnshire, that's what new numismatists think at the moment. Uh, Lincolnshire still gave allegiance to the Kingdom of York up to Athelstan's accession. And just to give you an idea what lies beyond that red line, if I can call it that these days, there's no, sim there's no symbolism to my choice of colours here. Um, a uh, powerful Kingdom of Northumbria. We call it the Viking Kingdom of York, but it's the Kingdom of Northumbrians. The Northumbrian church and the Northumbrian aristocracy of Anglian descent are still part of the supporters of these kings of Scandinavian origin who rule from York and whose kinsmen also rule in Dublin and control allies in Southern Ireland, Northern and Eastern Ireland, the Western Isles. They are a very powerful um, entity. They make marriage alliances with, well, the West Saxons, but also with the Scots. Um, Athelstan makes a treaty with them in 926, and a marriage alliance with one of his sisters, with Sitrich. But when Sitrich dies, and Sitrich's cousin, um, uh, or brother, Guthrith, comes over from York to claim the throne, Athelstan invades Northumbria. And this is the moment when the kingdom of all the English materialises. This is my rough delineation of the campaign in 927, or at least part of it. He uh, forces the kings of the Scots and Strathclyde Welsh to submit to him at Earmont Bridge, near Penrith, a religious ceremony of oath-taking at the church of Dacre, which was associated with the cult of St. Cuthbert. He goes and visits the tomb, visits the tomb of St. Cuthbert at uh, Chester Street. Uh, Guthrith escapes him, sieges York, so he has to come back down, uh, defeat Guthrith, and after a series of events, um, Guthrith surrenders to him, returns to Dublin, and the kingdom of all the English, albeit under... Um, military hegemony is created in 927 and they were conscious of the, this historic moment. Carta dirige gressus, says a, a continental poet in Athelstan's entourage writing a poem to the royal family in Winchester from the north of England echoing Ovid, let us send, wend your way across land and sea to the royal palace down in Winchester, to the queen mother, to the heir. King Athelstan lives Glorious through his deeds in Ista Perfecta Saxonia. You can see it, lines two and three lines from the bottom there with the abbreviation. Can you see? And on the opposite page, Constantine, the king of the Scots, is loyal in his service. So for the first time, the kings of North Britain are actually under the 
hegemonic rule of the kings of the south. And um, here's a map to help us on our way. I don't intend you to read very much into this, but it shows you what we're dealing with. The Scots up there, the Strathclyde Welsh under their own king. Uh, Northumbria, vast frontier land with the earls of Bambra now giving their allegiance, the Anglian earls of Bam Bambra giving their allegiance to Athelstan, the kings of Wales, of which there are quite a few, um, all under his hegemony. Um, I spoke about the coercive arrangements of the overlord. They include uh, tribute paying, huge tributes, um, uh, regular attendance in the king's house, in the king's hall, attendance on the king at the great religious festivals, rituals of hegemony, no doubt, and participating in the king's hosting when he raises an army. So this is the nature of the imperium of the West Saxons and a wonderful series of documents. Some of you will have seen these in the exhibition at the British Library not long ago. Um, give us a r real sense of, in, in personnel of the, the rulers and the, uh, the subdued with the kings of Wales attesting in these huge, and the kings of Scots, Strathclyde Welsh, attesting these huge um, uh, gatherings of sometimes more than 100 magnates are attesting the charter. So these are gatherings of maybe 1,000, 2,000 people. And uh, among them, uh, the earls of the Danelaw and of East Anglia, who have given their allegiance to the new king of all the English. And you can see there the list of the earls and, and dukes but some of them Scandinavian, and one, two, three, four, five, six down, Urm begins a very powerful earl, probably the, the, the Danish uh, Earl of Leicester, one of the five boroughs. Uh, further down, we can't place Ingvar or Halfdan, uh, but down at the bottom, Schooley and Hadda are from East Anglia, Schooley and Suffolk, um, and in the middle, Osulf and Uchtred, um, uh, the, from the royal house of Bambra, the, the kinsman of Bernard Cornwell's Uchtred in the last kingdom, if I can digress for a moment. So that's the nature of the hegemony, and that's what's going to bring together this coalition which will invade in, in 937 to try and destroy the great king, the, the Vasilefs, the Curagulus of the whole of the island of Britain, Rex Totius Britanniae, he ladles out these grand titles and seems to be able to demonstrate them. And the fury of his enemies is brought out in the most famous of the Welsh prophetic poems, the Armes Pridain, which talks about the possibility of an alliance between all the enemies to defeat the great king and the Garan Winion, the, the pale faces. The shit shovelers at one point he <laughs> describes the Saxons as we will drive them out at Aber Sandwich where they first landed. So the immediate the immediate um, crisis comes in 934 when the king of the Scots breaks his treaty. We don't exactly know how, but he breaks the terms of his treaty with Athelstan, and Athelstan, in retribution, assembles a great army in Winchester at Pentecost in 934. Uh, a totius Britanniae executus, an army drawn from the whole of Britain. And they, it's a mounted army. They go up. We can trace them in the documents in Nottingham, in York, Chesterless Street. They're there on the 1st of July. And then incredibly uh, across the 4th up to Donatar in Kincardinshire uh, and Fortriu, Caithness. It's the first mention in any literary, literary text of Caithness. Uh, it was both an, uh, a land and a naval force, our sources say. And whether the land force went as far as the north of Scotland, like Edward I in the 13th century, we don't know. Maybe it was just the naval forces devastated the Caithness. It was a vastatio, as they called it. And faced with this overwhelming display of force, Constantine, the king of the Scots, has to surrender and re-pledge his allegiance. And um, as you'll see, the arrow coming down, amazingly, we've got a document from Buckingham on the 13th of September with Constantine present. So clearly, this is the army coming back down. They spent 
uh, mid-December, they're in Froome again with Welsh kings signing the charter, testing the charter, and Christmas in Dorchester where three Welsh kings and Eugenius Owain, the king of the Strathclyde Welsh, are testing. Uh, so these are the clampdown begins, and in Cirencester in first half of 935, probably Easter, five kings are in attendance on Athelstan in Cirencester, in the great city formerly built by the Romans, the charter says, and Constantine is among them. So they've reached the point now where uh, armed resistance to the great king is inevitable, but it can only be achieved by a grand alliance, just as the Welsh poet thought. And the, the grand alliance comes in 937. Um, and of course, our most famous account of this, we don't know very much about the course of the events. I'm gonna try and explore them a little more. The north of England, it's fair to assume, was the subject, at least the first object of the invasion. Uh, and all we know from the most famous old English source, the famous poem on the Battle of Brunanburg, translated by Tennyson, Auden, wonderful gloss on it by Borges, the Argentinian laureate. Um, all we know is that an army jointly of the Scots and the North British and the Scandinavian Irish was defeated at a place called Brunambo with immense slaughter. Never since, as the history books tell us, the poem says at the end, never was there such a great slaughter since the uh, Angles and the Saxons first came across the, the wide waves of her Bradbrimu, Brichtena Sochtan, seeking out Britain. Here's the, there's the first famous lines here, Athelstan Kuning, you can see it there. Erle Dritten, Bernabe Giffer, the, the giver of rings, and his brother Edmund Atheling. Alda Langne Tir ye slogan at Secha, Sweorda Edjum, Imbe Brunambo, Bordwell Clufan, Heoan Hethelinda, Hammer a Lathan, Lathan, Afaran Edwiardas, the, the that this children of Edward. Uh, it doesn't tell us much about the battle, except there was a huge fight, spears clashing. In the end, they were driven into flight. The Mercians and the West Saxons defeated them. Uh, the, the Norse Irish fled across the sea back to Ireland at some point, and the Scots back to their own land. If we look for more detail, to try to get a picture of what actually happened, Let's look at one or two other sources. This was written probably within a very, very short time of the battle. It may be our earliest account. It's from the Annals of Ulster in Armagh, and they are in receipt of the news from the defeated side of the, of the um, North Irish, North British coalition. You can see it in the middle of the text there. An immense battle, lamentable and horrible between the English and the Northmen was fought crudelita, savagely, savagely fought, in which many thousands of the Northmen who cannot be numbered were killed. But the king himself, that is Anlaf, with a few escaped. On the other side, however, a multitude of the English were killed too. Athelstan, however, the king of the English, came away with a great victory. It's a fascinating passage, isn't it? Although it gives us no information whatsoever about what actually happened. Now we go to the bottom of this page here. This is a, a text written, a short series of annals written in Chesterle Street, which was then the shrine of St. Cuthbert, in the first half of the that second quarter of the 10th century. And new hints start to emerge here. First of all, the battle is not called Brunambo, it's called Wendun. I'll come back to that. It's an important clue. But the battle was fought against Anlaf Guthfridsson and the fleet from Ireland, who came with 615 ships. That is by far the biggest fleet of any named in our sources for the whole Viking period in the British Isles. 
Yeah? Against Constantine, the king of the Scots, and the king of the Cumbrorum, he calls them, Strathclyde Welsh. And uh, they won. That's, again, very close to the time. Other material other material that we've got that gives us any kind of clue ranges in often intractable ways, but this is a 17th century translation of the Annals of Clonmac Noes, and it's very circumstantial, and it obviously comes from a source from the first half of the 10th century, second quarter, even though this is all we have. Um, it, um, it has unique information about the content of the army that went over from Ireland and even gives us details on the dating. And that's the form in which it is. Here's a transcription. Uh, the Danes of Lochri, that is a big Viking army that had been in central Ireland in the middle of 937, uh, were attacked by Anlath Guthfrison on the 1st of August. We know that. Press ganged into joining the fleet. They came to Dublin. Then Anlath Orly with all the Danes of Dublin and the north part of Ireland departed and went overseas. They arrive in England, and with the help of the Danes of that kingdom. This is a very, very important piece of evidence, which is not only in Irish sources. It appears in later English sources as well. There were Danes within England who can only be from Northumbria and the five boroughs, or the five boroughs. They gave battle to the Saxons on the plains of Othlin. That's a garbled... Something's garbled in that between the two manuscripts and we don't know what that means. There was a great slaughter of the Northmen and the Danes. The ensuing captains were killed and the sons of uh, uh, Citrich, um, in Irish leaders with Irish names. Gibeah Khan, the king of the Western Isles, is an important Viking leader of the Hebrides. Uh, Caerlach, prince of Scotland, the old English poem on Brunanburh, says that the king of Scots lost his son. And there he's named. So, and there's casualty figures, some of which are realistic. 800 men in the uh, captains, that should read from the manuscript, around Arlaf Guthrison. They're probably like platoon leaders, you know, top Thainly kind of people. Uh, 4,000 men in the King of Denmark's own guard. What that means, we don't know. And fantasy figures for the Scots. So... That's all we know in terms of location and detail from any early source. Yeah? And out of that, here's a map drawn for me by, um, uh, by Sam Newton. Uh, out of that, over the last two or three hundred years, this is a very long controversy, <laughs> um, about 30 or 40 different places have been suggested for the site of Brunanburh, ranging from... Dumfrieshire, as you can see, down to Leighton Buzzard, Leighton Bromsworld, and Bedfordshire, um, born in Lincolnshire, uh, Lanchester, some of you may have seen Professor Breeze putting the claims forward for Lanchester, which has always been called Lanchester, but never mind, um, and holding the field, Bromber in the Wirral. Bromber in the Wirral. Um, First suggested in the 1930s, uh, the name is probably identical to Brunanburh, the Burg or in, the, the fort or the enclosure of Bruna. Uh, there are problems, though, although this is now in all the textbooks and 500-page uh, casebook published recently on it. Um, there are problems. The name only appears in, a, in the 12th century, and is Bromborough is not called Bromborough in Doomsday Book. So there is no guarantee that the name is pre-12th century. Um, but it is the only piece of evidence that attaches the Wirral conceivably to these events. There is no other evidence that the site could be there. So what follows um, is really offered to you on the basis of Let's keep an open mind. Historians proceed by hypothesis when they don't know the answers. Let's see if a chain of argument can be assembled. Let's see if these things stand up. Does this source really say what I think it says? Or am I leading it to an argument that I want to go on? Um, you've heard my summary of the politics of Viking Age Northumbria. And 
landing fleets in the Humber from Ireland. That, that's what happened in 940, for 939, 940, for example. You sail around Britain and you land there. You keep your fleet near you. Um, the, the idea that they might, this vast expedition might have sailed into the, um, into the, the D or the Mersey and escaped from there is on the face of it hard to imagine. But let's look at what the sources actually tell us. In 1122, a very good historian, John of Worcester, uh, wrote a chronicle of the early history of England in Worcester. He had access to a lot of interesting sources. Uh, he had access to a set of annals from York which had found their way to Worcester because York and Worcester had been held together as a bishop under the same bishop in the late English period. And from that set of annals, he hasn't made this up, he says, the pagan king of Ireland, Anlaf, Guthrison, of Ireland and many islands, and of course he is the overlord of the king of the Western Isles as well, who's with him on the expedition, as we've seen, incited by his father-in-law, the king of Scots, Constantine, sailed into the estuary of the river Humber with a huge fleet. He then goes on in Latin to amplify this brief account by a short Latin summary of the old English poem on Brunambo. Now, if that is true, and had this not been controversial, Nobody would have ever doubted that John of Worcester's account with its circumstantial annals from the second quarter of the 10th century, annals connected with the West Saxon battles with the Northumbrians, which can be linked to other source material. No one would have doubted that this was true. And as I say, um, that kind of picture can be shown to have taken place in the 940s with fleets from Ireland. And bearing that in mind, let's look at one or two sources which have not been considered in this whole argument, which throw entirely new light on these questions. First of all, in the late 1120s, the great historian William of Malmesbury, the greatest historian after Bede, discovered a certain very old manuscript, probably in the library at Glastonbury, which was a verse biography of King Athelstan from which he extracted pages of material as a prose preface and gives us 63 lines of what purports to be verbatim verse. Now, there's been a long argument about this and 40 years ago our greatest Latinist of this period, Michael Lapage, suggested these quotes had just been made up in the 12th century and we can't pay them any attention. And that has been the view. However, um, Professor Lapage's own work gives the tools to show that his earlier judgment w was not correct. Um, now that we have a lot more examples of the Latin written in the later 10th century, we can see that what William of Malmesbury has given us here is a versioning purporting to be a literal translation, but a versioning of a late 10th century poem in Latin hexameters. And uh, it retains, I won't get too complicated, it retains the rhyme schemes, Caldati and Leonini, the internal rhymes, the, the rhyme with the, the last word on the caesura to, uh, with the end of the verb, can you see, interis, and then the rhyme at Aquilonis, uh, even the the end rhymes, tyrannos and britanos, uh, which are bisyllable ca caudati. These forms of Latin were thought to have not been uh, developed in England in the 10th century, but now we know that they are. This is, this is a very close representation of a 10th century poem. Let's see what it tells us. Um, 15, 8, what does that add up to? 12, 5, 9, 12 years. Yes, 12 years passed, reigning his citizens, ruling his citizens by law, subduing tyrants by virtus, and then the hateful plague of Europe came again. Yam cubat in terris fera barbaries aquilonis. The, the barbarian monster 
clamped on the land. In teris aquilonis. This is standard Anglo-Latin for Northumbria. That is the way you wrote Northumbria in, um, uh, in Latin. Uh, the, the, term, the, line, the phrase fera barriers comes from the Merovingian poet Venantius Fortunatus, who's very much imitated in the late 10th century. This, to cut a long story short, is a, is a close versioning of a late 10th century poem. Uh, we, it goes on further. Um, uh, they left the, sea, and left, left the sea and camped on the land, breathing dreadful threats. Uh, there are references in both the Old English poem and the Latin poem to the words, the boasting, the threats, as if diplomacy had taken place which had been very hostile and very bitter. This probably indicates some kind of contact between the, the, the kings to try to negotiate a peace. At the will of the king of the Scots, Scotorum rege volente, comodata sensum borealis terra serenum. Again, borealis terra, uh, aquilonis plaga, and so on. This is, this is conventional Latin for Northumbria, and this has not been correctly translated in any uh, source. Um, and moreover, comodat a sensum serenum, uh, they gave willing assent, happy assent. They submitted happily to the invaders in Northumbria. And all again the references to the noise, they, they, they frightened the air with their words, you know. Cedunt indigeni, the, the local people submitted. The whole province submitted to the proud. So you have three references there to the province of the Northumbrians, two of them. So what's clear in this text from a reliable historian is that the Northumbrians submitted in 937 to the invaders. And that means, of course, in the region of York, just as we would have suspected from other material. And out of this, I'm going to throw a few real hypotheticals at you now because I'm trying to build up a tentative picture from this. You get a chronology something like this. Take it with a pinch of salt, of course. We don't know. First of August, we know Anne Love Guthrison and his army attacked the Vikings on Loch Ree and returned with them to Dublin. Then they all left Dublin, let's say early August. One of the Irish annals uh, recounts an attack by one of Guthrison's leaders on a shrine in Strangford Loth. So maybe that gives a little indicator. The King of the Hebrides joins them. Maybe that's mid-August. A fortnight later, they round and into the Humber. In the, in the summer, it's an easy journey. And the Northumbrians submit by the beginning of September. If that hypothesis, which is based on John of Worcester and the William of Malmesbury text, others support it, we'll come to them in a minute, then what we're really looking at is that zone there for the War of 937. York at the top. Derby and Nottingham at the bottom. There are two main uh, routes. One which goes York um, through Castleford and then all the way down to Derby and Nottingham, the, the left-hand route. The other across to the Trent and down to Lincoln. Um, but we can be pretty sure that the main route would have been the left-hand route. This is a map I've drawn showing five campaigns from the 920s, 30s and 40s where we precisely know the routes that the army took. The poem of 942 describes Edmund's army, for example, um, stopping its march at a line drawn between Dor and Whitwell Gap um, near Worksop, that grey line cutting across. There's a battle at Castleford in uh, uh, 948. There's a submission at Tanshelf near Pontefract in 947. Uh, there's no doubt uh, even the, the routes used by the Viking armies going south, Anlaf Guthrison, when he attacks the five boroughs in 940, goes all the way down to Leicester and beyond, beyond comes down this route. So we, this is the route of the, the war, probably, I would say. It's a good assumption, 
that that's the main military route in the wars between the West Saxons and the Northumbrians, because this is what this war is, if you like. The Northumbrians were their Scots allies. So what happened? Well, William of Malmesbury's quote goes on to give us some very interesting detail, which has never been considered by any historian. Because the poem attacks Athelstan for his failure to act, for his failure to move swiftly against the invaders, of standing back, as it were, deeming his service done, it says at the top, while they destroyed everything with their terrible ra raids, the peasants being driven off the fields, the, 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 the fields being set on fire. Um, and again, uh, the characteristic rhyme schemes of late 10th century Anglo-Latin are, are there to be seen with the rhymes at the end, the rhymes between sentences, internal rhymes, uh, totis viridantia gramina, phrase from uh, um, Valentius Fortunatus. Um, so great was the force of infantry, so great was the the horsemen, innumerabilium concursus quadrupedantum. It's a, a tour de force hexameter with a multi-syllable ending in metre. Eventually, it says, the complaining rumour roused Athelstan and he moved. Uh, elsewhere, William of Malmesbury says, who'd read the whole text, of course, these are just edited bits of this text, says actually the real reason was, of course, the, the threat was so enormous that he had to delay and delay until he gathered big enough forces to be able to confront them. Not like Harold in 1066, for example. Now, it's very interesting, that this story of a great delay before Brunambur doesn't appear just in William of Malmesbury. It's a major feature, for example, of the famous saga, Egil's saga, from the 13th century. It's a fictional account of these events, but it's certainly a fictional account of Brunambur. And in it, there's a very long delay between the battle, which the saga writer embroiders with diplomatic toing and froing, as Athelstan deliberately uh, keeps them on edge in the, in the diplomacy while he's gathering his army. Now, here's where numismatics has a place to play, and I'm sure, you know, like. Michael Dolly, in fact, I, I can remember coming here as a student and hearing the great Michael Dolly do a lecture, used to say, you have to use the totality of the evidence. And, and uh, coinage is pr proving all sorts of interesting stuff here, and new finds are being made all the time, some of them specifically with these events, like 927, the Harrogate Horde, for example. And uh, some, quite a few years ago now, Christopher Blunt, who was the, the expert on... Athelstan, who wrote a great study of the coinage of Athelstan, noticed a strange phenomenon that late in Athelstan's reign, in York and in Derby and in Nottingham, uh, double reverses are produced by the official mint, as if the moneyers didn't want to show the king's image and name on their coins, but keep producing coins. And the most striking example of this is Nottingham, where 10 coins have survived from Athelstan's Nottingham Mint, and seven of them are these made by the official mint. You can see top quality coins here. Um, and Blunt suggested that the, a possible context for the, these was that Athelstan's rule north of the Trent collapsed in 937, and that for a period, while nobody knew what the outcome was going to be, the moneyers, the period was long enough for the moneyers to carry on minting coins, but they minted these coins. We don't know the answer, but it's a, it's a very, very interesting question. And the, the, there's some evidence for that picture elsewhere, again, which has escaped the people writing about this. The Chronicle of Thomas of Castleford, which is early 14th century, um, but local detail and data, Thomas of Castleford, says that when the Scottish army had occupied Yorkshire, marched through Yorkshire, they then turned south, and that the Athelstan's knights, his thanes, in other words, the, the, the military on the estates in 
Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire who are there to defend that frontier land um, all fled beyond the trend. Now, it's a very late source, but it's very circumstantial. And again, I'm dealing in hypotheses, but um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? It makes sense. Now, I'm going even more hypothetical now, so you're going to have to be very patient with my whimsy, perhaps. It would look something like this if this chain of hypotheses works. September, Athelstan, you can ride down to Winchester in three days from Northumbria, you know, gathers his army. He know, he's got the news. The invaders raid into Mercia. The William of Malmesbury text describes terrible plundering raids, devastating the countryside, probably deep into northern Mercia. In October, maybe, Athelstan marches up into the war zone. Um, Tamworth, I've put in as a speculation. It's central, and his Mercian allies are very, very important to him. He's a Mercian. He's their, he's their guy, and, and, he's, and they are important in the battle. And diplomacy between the two sides takes place. The battle then would be end of October. It could be November. could even be early December. One of the, our Irish sources makes it look as if it was almost at the end of the year. Constantine and Anlaf Guthfrison flee to Scotland. Guthfrison's return to Dublin is not given in the Irish sources until after Easter. So he hasn't just sailed in a day and a half from the Wirral back to Dublin. Now, where was the battle for? This is the final stage of my argument, if you like. Um, let's look again at that that line, the military roots of the armies in the second quarter of the 10th century. And let's go back to the source that we, we saw at the beginning. A Chester Le Street source doesn't call the battle Brunambo, it calls it Wen Dun. A Dun, as Professor Margaret Gelling showed in a characteristically uh, brilliant and um, inclusive article. A dun is not just any old hill, it's not just a tumulus, it's a major feature of the landscape, it's a massif, if you like. And the first element, when, when dun, when could be any feature of the landscape that makes sense to us, it doesn't sound like a personal name, but it could be a river name. And if you look back into our zone of conflict, then right across the middle of the picture, there is indeed a river with a, w, with a W E N. And it is astounding that this has never been discussed by any of the scholarship on Brunampo. Sometimes viewed as A. H. Smith shows in his great survey on the place names of the West Riding, sometimes actually used, actually the frontier of the Northumbrians, the southern frontier, it varies where that is, um, the Went. And if you drive up from, on the A1, from, from the south, then this is what you see as you approach the river Went, a very big dun, Went Hill. Went Hill. Um, carry that in mind. Because, of course, what we're really searching for is Brunambo. And here's the next astounding <laughs> turn up. We mainly rely on the spelling of Brunambo, B R U N A N B U R H, the fort, fort of Bruna, or the fort by the Bruna. With the, uh, we mainly rely on the Anglo-Saxon, the Old English poem, the famous poem. And that appears in several manuscripts. We rely on the A manuscript, Corpus 173. But that, which is written in 955-ish, but that is not the most accurate version of the poem. A better text is in B. And B um, spells it with a double N. And so does C, which derives from the exemplar of B. You can, I think, see, um, you can see the divide of the poem. 
nearly about a third the way down. And um, three lines down into that, you can see with a separation between the two ends, Brunanbu. The spelling is a double N. And here's the A manuscript, the most famous manuscript of the Chronicle. And if you look there at the beginning of the poem, you'll notice the scribe has put in, three lines down, a little extra N above the single N. So three of our, the key three manuscripts of the, the poem in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle actually spell it in that way. And they're not the only ones. Simeon of Durham in the Libellus has two spellings from a vernacular source, although he's in Latin, you can see, at Brunan work, vel Brunanburg. And that's a northern source. That's a northern source, independent of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. If you tabulate those, then this is what you get. It's interesting, isn't it? How the most obvious thing is, on the principle of turning no stone unturned, you get that. Now, there's certainly a question to be asked, I think. I'm not a philologist, uh, but there is a question to be asked, isn't there? And then you look, what was the editorial principle looking at this name? Well, the answer is, in the editions of the poem, it was in 1938 that the single N spelling became canonical and nobody paid any more attention to the double N. The 500-page case book published recently has no interest in the double N. But prior to 1938, Charles Plummer, in his edition, put the top one for manuscript A with an extra apostrophe N in it. Um, Nora Kershaw, Benjamin Thorpe, all the early editors simply spelt Brunambur with two N's. Even Sir Frank Stenton spelt it with two N's before the Campbell edition of 1938. So it's not m merely a matter of the relative weight of these manuscripts. And of course, the version in B and C, the version in B is, is a, a better text of the poem. It's how editors have approached it. It's misled us. And it's not merely a matter of um, what it, what, how you spell it. It means something different. Brunan with a double N means the boer at the spring. Now, where on the Great North Road would you find a fort and a prominent spring? And the answer is next door to Went Hill, to Wendun. There it is. Robin Hood's well, St. Helen's well, it's the most famous and copious spring on the Great North Road. And even, even more striking uh, than that, and you can see even actually the, the, the spring rises inside the Roman fort, and the Roman road has been realigned twice to include that. Uh, and there in the, you can see in the aerial picture the, the shape of the fort. The, the left-hand side of it's been demolished by the, the road, but the, it's still there, visible. There's something else to say about this place. It's a very, very remarkable place in northern history because this is the place where the Northumbrians traditionally met the southern rulers. This is where Adventus ceremonies took place, where the Northumbrians met Edward IV and submitted to him. It's where the army on the Pilgrimage of Grace uh, assembled, the 36,000 strong northern army to contest Henry VIII. It's where after the failure of the Pilgrimage of Grace, the, the, the chastened gentry of Yorkshire made their submission to Henry VIII. And this goes right back in time uh, southern kings on their itineraries stop close by, either here or at Hampole. Uh, in 947, Eadred, uh, Athelstan's half-brother, takes the submission of the Northumbrians a mile or two to the north of Went Hill at Tanshelf. Um, so it's a very significant place in Northumbrian history. And uh, it also, and the, the data here is from A.H. Smith, um, 
place names of West Yorkshire. Uh, it's also part of a network of Bourg names from the Viking Age, which Smith thought show a, um, are facing south. Most of them bear Scandinavian names. Some of them big, Conisbrook, Kunugus Bourg, the King's Bourg. Um, and there is our fort at the spring, but it has lost its prefix by doomsday and is simply recorded as Bourg. But it is the Bourg at the spring. So there you go. I'm going to finish now. Um, uh, I hope I've given, I hope I've tantalized you first of all, because it's a chain of suppositions, isn't it? But as Bernard Bischoff says in a famous, um, very famous piece on Charlemagne's library, um, everything that I've told you is a chain of supposition. And none of the links can be proved beyond any doubt. But when you put it all together, it makes a co cogent case which is better than any other case. So Bischoff says, and I'm suggesting to you that I don't know where Brown Bull was, but this seems to me to have much more going for it in terms of the historical sources, the context of Northumbria, the numismatics, the totality of the evidence, as Michael Dolly would say, than any of the places marked on that map. And, um, uh, and finally, uh, many questions still arising, but I hope I've shown you how by squeezing the data, I'd given up on this 20 years ago, and it was only when I looked back at the priority of the spelling of Wendun, and it was only when I looked back at the manuscript evidence for Brunambo, dissatisfied with the 500 pages of the case book and Blackwell's Encyclopedia of Anglo-Saxon England, all those things that assume uh, Brombra, that I, I looked again. Um, and it's our job as historians to keep an open mind on things, to work by hypothesis, to, to move the argument forward. And I've no doubt that more discoveries are to be made, especially in numismatics. There's an interesting hoard of 66 coins of Athelstan turned up just close to York at the moment, deposited late in his reign with more of these double, um, double reverses. And also, I'll leave you with the last thought, memorialization. You know, we look at the great kings on the continent, Charles the Bald, Louis the Pious, um, and we think of later kings, William the Conqueror, Henry IV. How do you memorialize a great battle like this where untold losses were caused and Athelstan's two cousins were killed in the battle, buried in Malmesbury. Um, the English losses were huge. Uh, in what way do you commemorate? In what way do you acknowledge the enormous losses in the war in Northumbria, which obviously extended into the following year, judging by our sources, up into Cumbria? Um, is there any truth in the... St. Leonard's cartillary uh, story, the, the, the famous hospital of St. Peter later became St. Leonard, founded by Athelstan after the Battle of Brunaba. Is there any truth in that story? It would make a lot of sense as a Carolingian king doing something like that. Did he even leave a memorial chapel on the spot? Um, interesting questions. And I, with that, I will leave you 